the desertion of the Saxons to the enemy obliged the emperor to order movements to which he would not otherwise have resorted, especially in so warm an action. These unexpected movements caused disorder when that calmness and that cool determination by which so much may be done at the decisive moment of a battle were most wanting. And it was now necessary to think of a retreat, which had indeed already begun in consequence of the physical and moral exhaustion of the troops, which had maintained the contest since the morning under marked disadvantages. The enemy soon perceived that our troops were retiring, but his attacks were not relaxed. The bridge at Leipzig was the only passage whereby the retreat could be effected, and it was inconceivable how the staff of the army could have neglected to build other bridges. Their construction would have been quite easy, as in such a town as Leipzig, materials and workmen would have been found in abundance if the artifices of the army had been insufficient. Prince of Neuchâtel declared that he had directed bridges to be prepared. The artillery and engineer departments asserted that they had received no orders. Whether the neglect was in the issuing or the execution of the orders, the consequences were not the less disastrous. After nearly the whole of the left and part of the center had passed the Elster, the emperor himself crossed. He desired the artillery officer who had charge of the bridge for the destruction of which preparation had been made not to leave the spot and not to put the match to the train until all the troops had passed over. At first, the corps proceeded along the bridge without any disagreeable accident. But such was the disorder that no one could tell whether or not his column was the last which had to pass. The enemy's sharpshooters were in advance. The pressure towards the bridge was great, and the confusion became extreme. The officer left in charge of the bridge, not knowing what was the state of things on the enemy's side, ran towards the general officer to learn, if possible, from him how far the passage had been affected, but he was carried away by the crowd and could not return. The artillery men who were under his command, seeing German troops and Cossacks pushing forward, blew up the bridge without waiting for orders, and thus the right of the army, which kept the enemy's masses in check, was cut off. A report of this unfortunate event soon spread through the ranks. The right was in its turn thrown into disorder, and an escape was sought through fields and marshes. This completed the disaster. The troops were made prisoners of war, and Generals Oreston and Renier were taken with them. Prince Joseph Poniatowski, recently made Marshal of France, had just at this moment gained the banks of the Elster. Though wounded, consulting only his courage, he plunged on horseback into the river where he unfortunately perished. It was impossible to be more brave than was this prince, impetuous, magnanimous, and always amiable. He was as much esteemed by those against whom he combated as regretted by the party whom he served. Thus terminated the fatal day of Leipzig, the result of which to France was the loss of a fine and numerous army and all her allies. Chapter 18. The king of Saxony remained at Leipzig. The emperor waited on him to bid him adieu and expressed his sincere regret at having involved him in his bad fortune. The situation of the king of Saxony was a very painful one, inasmuch as he was exposed to the resentment of other sovereigns who had pursued a line of conduct less honorable than his. The Saxon army deserted from our ranks and entered those of our enemy. That was done without his order or participation. His name was, however, made use of to seduce the troops. They were told that the king had joined the alliance against France and that the French were carrying him off. Russia neglected no paltry artifice of this kind to destroy the influence of France over the armies of the German princes. But of all the members of the coalition, he who resorted to the most unworthy means was Bernadotte. He had commanded the Saxons when he was one of our generals, and he availed himself of the advantages which this circumstance afforded to deceive them. Correspondence proclamations were actively employed and no kind of seduction was spared after the defeat at Leipzig, which was truly destructive. There remained no other course for the emperor to take but to retire to the banks of the Rhine. The army took the road by Erfurt, Gotha, Fulda, and Hanau, but provisions were everywhere deficient. This unfortunate circumstance put an end to all order among 
the troops. I know not how this neglect could have occurred, but all the expense which had been laid out on the magazines was completely lost. The army, finding no means of subsistence in the villages situated on its route, spread over the country in quest of provisions. The consequence was a complete disorganization of the army. It was no longer anything more than a confused multitude pursued by the enemy's light troops and flying, as it were, by instinct to the frontier. In passing through Erfurt, the emperor left the garrison there to retard the pursuit and to oblige the enemy to make a circuit to gain the road to Hanau, whither our army was marching. The deplorable state of our affairs was soon known at Paris. It was a heavy blow to the public, as it destroyed all the hopes which it had cherished of happiness and repose. At Paris, we were informed of the defection of Bavaria, even before the emperor knew it. And what is more, we obtained the first intelligence of the march of the Bavarian and Austrian army under the command of the Bavarian general von Vreda, for whom the emperor had shown so much regard in the preceding campaigns. He arrived by forced marches at Hanau before our columns with the design of giving the finishing stroke to the French army, which had so generously combated for the independence of his country and which had at the same time laid the foundation of his glory and his private fortune. He who is really ungrateful is never so by halves. He was not satisfied with making his country revolt against France. He wished to give a death blow to our remaining force. In one day, the Bavarians became the most implacable of our enemies. They forgot that if, instead of combating for their independence, the emperor had been disposed to sacrifice them to Austria, he would have extinguished all the resentments of that power and removed all future cause of dispute. The moral influence of the Allies was prodigiously increased by the Battle of Leipzig, while their physical force was augmented by the Bavarians and the Württembergers and by troops of all the other German states. The war minister still served the emperor with great zeal. He estimated the danger to which the army was exposed and very judiciously sent all the troops which could be collected to Mentz. At the same time, he proposed to the empress, who presided in the council of ministers, to raise and promptly organize the national guards of Lorraine, Alsace, the banks of the Rhine, and Franche-Comte. This proposition was adopted, but a thousand difficulties impeded its execution because the arsenals were almost empty. The arms having been sent to Poland before the disastrous winter of 1812, where they fell into the hands of the enemy. It was easy to perceive the difficulties which were to be encountered in supplying the wants of the army. The position which the Bavarians had taken intercepted the emperor's communications with France, and consequently conjectures supplied the place of facts, and when gloomy ideas get into the mind, there are no limits to the forebodings of the imagination. Consternation was general. Nothing was foreseen but misfortunes, and they were not slow in arriving. An antidote which deserves a place in history remains to be told, and this seems to be the proper time for relating it. For some time, the police established at Rome had been sending information that, according to reports received from Naples, the government of that country had listened to propositions made by the English and was preparing to join the coalition. Absurd as such a report appeared, it was circulated with so many details and circumstances that it was difficult to refuse belief to the existence of some intercourse between the Neapolitan minister and the agents of the British government. It followed then that the king of Naples, who commanded the cavalry and the emperor's army, must have given secret instructions for opening these negotiations, or that he had no objection to the queen regent opening them in his absence. In whatever way the business was managed, such a proceeding was not the less blamable, as the enemy must have concluded that the emperor's affairs were indeed in a most desperate state when the king of Naples was deserting him. This transaction was considered so criminal in France that public opinion revolted against it. At first, nobody seemed disposed to believe that anything had happened, as the king of Naples had the reputation of a brave and candid man. However, nothing was more true as will presently be seen. While the reports of the Neapolitan negotiations were getting strength at Rome, where they destroyed public confidence, I received an account from Florence of the passage of the Neapolitan of high consideration. The Duke of Rocca Romana, grand equerry of the court through that city, on his way to meet the king at the army. 
on comparing the period of the Duke's journey through the French departments. Beyond the Alps, with the date of the Neapolitan defection, it plainly appears that he was the messenger employed on the occasion, and that the only object of his mission was to inform the king that everything was prepared and that nothing was wanting but his presence. This messenger passed through Lyon and proceeded by the route of Strasbourg and Mentz, fell in with the army beyond Hanau through which town he passed before it was occupied by the Bavarians. He found the king of Naples at Eisnach, where his headquarters were, and on the report which the king received, he took his departure with the greatest precipitation. Was he ordered to go to the outpost to facilitate the march of the army as the great difficulty of the retreat was no longer doubtful? Or was he keeping himself at a distance from the imperial headquarters to find an opportunity for escape, either because he dreaded that the emperor might obtain information of his projects or because he thought it then advisable to withdraw himself completely from his observation? I cannot tell. But I learn almost at the same moment the passage of the Duke of Rocco Romana through Mentz and the departure of the King of Naples from the army. He traveled through Mentz, Strasbourg, to the Alps, where he crossed by the way of the Simplon. He had thus the good fortune to pass through Hanau before the arrival of the Bavarian vanguard, which almost immediately after intercepted that road. In consequence of this state of things, it happened that the emperor had no opportunity to read the details sent to him on this subject until it was too late. The hasty journey of the King of Naples through France created general surprise. The first idea excited by it was that the Emperor had commissioned him to assemble his army and form a junction with the force under the Viceroy in order to protect Italy from an invasion which appeared to be contemplated and the execution of which was at that time rendered probable by the movements of the English troops in Sicily. Nobody attributed the return of the King of Naples to any other object, but this conjecture was far from the truth. Joachim passed through Turin, Florence, and Rome without dropping a word which could betray his project. Neither the Prince of Borghese, who governed Piedmont, nor the Princes of Lucca, who governed Tuscany, had the slightest idea of his views. He was still less suspected at Rome, where General Miaulis commanded. The arrival of the King of Naples was quickly followed by a new danger for Italy, where he soon after commenced hostilities against the French troops. About the same time, the defection of Westphalia took place. The misfortunes which the army had experienced rendered that an event inevitable but hastened as it was by a sudden eruption of cossacks it produced a very disagreeable impression in france as it was a proof of the emperor being abandoned by all his allies we were prepared for the loss of westphalia but it was not imagined that the mere appearance of some light troops would be sufficient to bring it about the following is the short history of this event while the emperor's army was still before leipzig a corps of Cossacks passed over the Elbe below Magdeburg, marched through Hanover, and advanced with great rapidity to Castle, where the King of Westphalia still was. Such was the idea of the security which existed at the time. At the Russian general who commanded the Cossacks arrived quite unexpectedly at the spot where the Westphalian artillery used to exercise the guns, some pieces, and their ammunition, which were there, were supposed to be perfectly safe on account of the vicinity to the capital, but they were carried off the castle, through which the Cossacks passed at full gallop. On the first alarm, everyone fled. The king was obliged to withdraw, but he was faithfully accompanied by his guards. He proceeded only to a short distance from the capital, where he was soon informed of the force of the court, which had attacked him. The infantry of the garrison had shut themselves up in the citadel, but the enemy was obliged to retire almost as soon as he had entered. That, however, did not much advance the affairs of the king of Westphalia, who was obliged to follow the movement of the Grand Army and to place himself behind the Rhine, which he passed at Bonn or Cologne. His guards followed him to the banks of the river, and there he bade them farewell. The greater part returned to castle, the rest repaired to their homes. The king and queen proceeded to Paris, accompanied by the persons who had attached themselves to their destiny.
Several days had passed without any news being received from the emperor. We had learned nothing since the communication was intercepted by the taking of Hanau. He was a Offended at the conduct of the Bavarian government, and his dissatisfaction was greatly aggravated when he recollected how badly he had been served with respect to foreign information. He received almost at the same time the news of the arrival of General von Vreda's corps at Hanau and a report from his minister at Munich, stating that the that Bavaria would remain faithful to the alliance, notwithstanding his ill fortune. What must appear still more extraordinary is that the letter of the French minister at Munich was dated on the very day in which the treaty concluded at Raid was signed in virtue of which the Bavarian and Austrian troops reunited and marched to the banks of the Rhine. It is obvious that the French minister must have drawn up his report very inconsiderately or have been singularly deceived, for he was too honorable a man to be suspected of treachery. The advanced guard of the army retreating from Leipzig debouched by the road from Fulda to Hanau, where it fell in with the Bavarians, who had been there for several days in position. They were not dealt with gently. On the contrary, they were attacked with great fury, and the French soldiers showed no mercy to those who fell into their hands. They were filled with indignation at seeing troops for whom they had fought in 1805 and 1809 so perfidiously turning their arms against them. The passage was soon over. Open. The Bavarian army took the road of the main, and we did not choose to lose in its pursuit that time, which was so valuable for securing the retreat of the Grand Army. The march was accelerated as much as possible, and this multitude, which had more the appearance of a mob than an army, was at last conducted to Mentz. The dispersion of the soldiers from the different regiments was at its height, and to increase the misfortune, the commissariat, accustomed to reckon on success, had established no magazines at Mentz. This rendered it necessary to distribute the army through the villages and to quarter the soldiers on the inhabitants. This measure, which would have been very proper if the different corps had been reorganized, had on this occasion a disastrous result inasmuch as it retarded the rallying of the scattered soldiers. Reverses, fatigue, and privations had so broken down their spirits that they were different to everything. They stopped at the first places they came to and fixed themselves there. How much it is to be regretted the supplies of all descriptions were not formed at Mentz, where the army could have been concentrated within a space sufficiently limited to admit of the troops being frequently inspected and supplied with provisions. We should then undoubtedly have succeeded in restoring order and making this disorganized force reassume a respectable attitude, instead of which the dispersion of the soldiers rendered the activity of the general almost useless. His orders, for the most part, were left unexecuted, And the state of the army, far from improving, grew worse. Contagious diseases spread amongst the troops and completed their ruin. Never had the French army presented so melancholy a picture. Peace was loudly called for as the only means of obtaining the necessary time to remedy so many evils. But we shall see how difficult it was to conclude peace. The emperor had arrived at Mentz. His heart was rent by the state of affairs, but he reproached nobody. His situation was dreadful. He had an advanced guard at Hochheim on the right bank of the Rhine, a garrison in Danzig at the mouth of the Vistula, one in each of the fortresses of Stettin, Kustern, and I believe also in Glogau on the Oder, and one in Spandau near Berlin. On the Elbe, he had, as I have already stated, 30,000 men in Dresden, about 18,000 in Torgau, five or 6,000 in Wittenberg, about 10,000 in Magdeburg, and 30,000 in Hamburg. He had also left four or five thousand in Erfurt on leaving that place. All these garrisons would have given him a fresh army if he had gained the Battle of Leipzig. He lost it, and these troops not only became useless, but their absence added to the ruin of his affairs. The system of war had changed since the armies brought into the field had become so numerous. Regular sieges were discarded. A fortress was blockaded by late troops who waited quietly till the garrison had eaten its last bushel of flour. In the meantime, the great armies acted offensively against each other, and that of the two which gained the last battle made a Charlemagne. Chapter 19. Such were the afflicting results of the Battle of Leipzig, the consequences of which could never have been to our enemies if they had lost the day what they became to us.
I have already said that before the engagement, the emperor had a presentiment of what would happen. He even foresaw that if he gained the battle, there would not remain to him sufficient means to give to his success the results capable of securing peace. This was his reason for wishing France to display new strength in proportion to the enormous mass of enemies whom adversity had united against us. With this view, he sent an order to the Empress Regent to convoke the Senate extraordinarily and to go there and make an exposition of the misfortunes with which France was menaced by the defection of all her allies. The Empress spoke to that assembly in a dignified and elevated tone, which gave to her youth a luster still greater than that which it derived from her high rank and birth. She felt deeply for the misfortunes of a country which she had freely adopted. She thought that each individual Frenchman was bound to think nothing of any sacrifices which could prevent the ruin of the national edifice. She was listened to attentively and inspired everybody with the most lively interest for her. She departed from the hall of the Senate amidst the most respectful enthusiasm of the whole assembly. Monsieur Regnon Saint-Jean d'Angely, whose indefatigable zeal was commensurate with his talents, developed the motives of the policy of the government in requiring a new levy of men. The pressing danger did not permit any reflection. The proposal was approved because the impossibility of carrying it into effect was less considered than the imperious necessity of refusing nothing, whatever that might preserve the territory from an invasion against which it was almost without defense. Besides, it was no longer a question of making conquests, but of guarding ourselves against conquest in our turn. This appeal of the Empress to the Senate was made before the arrival of the army at Mentz, and consequently before it had experienced the losses which rendered the retreat necessary, so that the first reflection which occurred with respect to this levy was that it would not be sufficient and that before long a second would infallibly be necessary to place the army in the state into which it had been wished to bring it before the fortune of arms was tried at Leipzig. This idea agonized all hearts. Confidence disappeared. The future no longer afforded the prospect of consolation. And men's minds were filled with all sorts of conjectures respecting the changes which it was foreseen must take place in consequence of inability to prevent them. There is no doubt that peace was the general desire. Peace of any kind would have satisfied the country, but it did not enter into the thought of any person to sacrifice him from whom the national love and gratitude were not completely detached. The progress of events produced successive changes in those dispositions. I shall give an account of them in the order in which they occurred. As soon as I was informed of the emperor's arrival at Mentz, I transmitted to him a description of the gloomy appearances which I perceived around me, and I urged him to come to Paris and give impulse to that national movement without which there was no chance of safety. Time was flying fast, and malevolence added to depression would have operated more powerfully than any impulse that could have been given from Mentz. The emperor arrived in Paris at the beginning of November, attended by all who had followed him to the army, a circumstance which occurred almost immediately after the emperor's arrival for the moment suspended the gloomy anticipations which had taken possession of the public mind. The French minister of the Duke of Saxe Weimar was seized by a detachment of the enemy's troops who violated the residence of the duke. He was sent to Toplitz then conveyed back to the headquarters of the Allies, and then summoned to Monsieur de Metternich, with whom he had a long conversation, of which he rendered an account on his return. After having been, said Monsieur de Saint-Aignan, in his report, treated during two days like a prisoner of war at Weimar, where the emperors of Austria and Russia had fixed their headquarters, I received orders to set out for Bohemia with a convoy of prisoners. Hitherto I had seen nobody, nor made any remonstrance conceiving that the title with which I was invested ought to be a sufficient protection. Besides, I had already protested against the treatment to which I was subjected. However, I now thought it advisable to write to the Prince Schwarzenberg and Count Metternich to represent the impropriety of the proceeding. Prince Schwarzenberg immediately sent to me his aide-de-camp, Count Park, to apologize for the mistake that had been committed and to invite me either to his residence or to that of Count Metternich. I proceeded immediately to the latter because Prince Schwarzenberg was not at home. Prince Metternich received me with the most marked politeness. He made some allusion to my situation from which he took upon himself to relieve me. 
esteeming himself happy, he said, to render me the service, and at the same time to testify, the Emperor of Austria's esteem for the Duke of Vicenza. He then spoke to the Congress, though I had said nothing that could lead to that turn of the conversation. We sincerely wish for peace, said he, and we are ready to conclude it. The thing is, to set about the business openly and straightforwardly, the coalition will continue united. Any indirect means which the Emperor Napoleon may employ to attain peace will never be attended by any result. Let all parties explain themselves clearly one to another, and then possibly peace may be concluded. After this conversation, Count Metternich informed me that I must proceed to Toplitz, where I should soon hear from him, and that he hoped to see me on my return on the 27th of October. I set out for Toplitz, where I arrived on the 30th. On the 2nd of November, I received a letter from Count Metternich, in consequence of which I quitted Toplitz on the 3rd, and repaired to the headquarters of the Emperor of Austria at Frankfurt, where I arrived on the 8th. I waited at Count Metternich that day. He spoke to me of the success of the Allied armies of the revolution that was taking place in Germany, and of the necessity to make peace. He told me that the Allies, long before the declaration of Austria, had greeted the Emperor Francis with the title of Emperor of Germany, that he had Fuse that insignificant title, but that Germany in that way belonged to him more than ever before. Mr. Metternich wished Napoleon to be convinced that the greatest impartiality and moderation prevailed in the councils of the Allied powers, but that they felt themselves strong in proportion to their moderation, that none of them entertained designs against the dynasty of Emperor Napoleon, that England was much more moderate than was supposed, and that there never was more favorable vote for treating with that power, that if the Emperor Napoleon really wished to conclude a lasting peace, he would spare a great deal of misery to mankind and danger to France by no longer retarding the negotiations, that the Allies were ready to come to an understanding, that the conditions on which they proposed to conclude peace were of a nature to keep England within equitable bounds and to ensure to France by sea all the freedom to which the other European powers could pretend, that England was willing to make Holland, as an independent state, many concessions which she would not make to that country as a province of the French Empire that what Monsieur de Mirfelt had been instructed to say on the part of the Emperor Napoleon might give rise to several declarations which he would beg of me to report accurately and without any change whatever that though the Emperor Napoleon would not think of a balance of power in Europe, yet that balance was not only possible but necessary, that it had been proposed in Dresden to take by way of compensation different territories which the emperor no longer possessed as for example the duchy of warsaw and that similar compensations might be stipulated at present count metternich requested that i would call on him in the evening of the ninth i accordingly went and arrived just as he had returned from the palace of the emperor of austria from whom he gave me a letter to the empress maria louisa count metternich told me that he immediately expected Count Nessaroda, in whose presence he would communicate what he wished me to announce to the emperor, he directed me to inform the Duke de Vincenza that he still cherished for him those sentiments of esteem which his excellent character had always inspired. In a few moments, Count Nessaroda arrived. He briefly repeated to me what Count Metternich had already said respecting the mission which I was requested to undertake. He added that Monsieur de Hardenberg might be considered as present and acceding to all that had been said. Here, Monsieur de Metternich explained the intentions of the Allies in the way in which I was to report them to the Emperor. When he had concluded, I replied that as my part was that of a listener and not a speaker, all I had to do was report literally word for word, what had fallen from him, and that to ensure accuracy. I requested permission to write it down merely for my own use, and that I would submit my memorandum to his examination. Count Nessarota proposed that I should prepare this memorandum immediately, upon which Count Metternich conducted me to another apartment, where I wrote as follows, having concluded I returned to the apartment where I had left Messrs. Metternich and Nesselroda on my entrance. Count Metternich said, Here is Lord Aberdeen, the English ambassador. As his intentions coincide with ours, 
we may continue our conversation in his presence. He then requested me to read what I had written. When I came to the article concerning England, Lord Aberdeen appeared not to understand it. I read it a second time, and he then observed that the freedom of trade and the right of navigation were very vague expressions. I replied that I had written what Monsieur de Metternich had instructed me to communicate. Monsieur de Metternich observed that these expressions might certainly embarrass the question and that it would be better to substitute others in their stead. He took the pen and wrote that England would make the greatest sacrifices for a peace founded on these bases. Those mentioned above. I remarked that these expressions were no less vague and than those that had been canceled. Lord Aberdeen was of the same opinion. He said it would be better to restore what I had first written and again repeated the assurance that England was ready to make the greatest sacrifices that she possessed much and would restore liberally. The remainder of the memorandum being found conformable with the communication that had been made to me, the conversation turned on in different subjects. Prince Schwarzenberg now entered and we went through the whole business again. Count Nessel Rota, who left the room for a moment during the conversation conversation on his return charged me on the part of the Emperor Alexander to inform the Duke de Vicenza that his majesty would never change his opinion of his character in good faith and that if he were appointed as the negotiator everything would be speedily arranged. I was set out next morning the 10th of November but Prince Schwarzenberg requested that I would wait until the evening as he had not yet had time to write to the Prince of Neuchatel. In the course of the night Count Vona Prince Schwarzenberg's aide-de-camp brought me the letter and conducted me to the advance post. On the morning of the 11th, I arrived at Memphis. Thus, we were to relinquish all that remained of our conquests to sanction the consequences which our reverses had entailed to surrender Italy, to evacuate Holland, and all this for obtaining not peace, but the opening of negotiations, which would not protect France against the ravages which threatened her. No propositions could be more unacceptable and suspicious, yet they were not rejected. They were transmitted on the 15th of October. And on the 16th, Monsieur de Bassano replied that a peace founded on the independence of all nations, both in the continental point of view and in that of maritime relations, had always been the object of the emperor's wishes, and that he assented to the meeting of the Congress at Mannheim. But the political horizon was now changed. The reply was not thought sufficiently clear and precise. The cabinet of the Tuileries did not admit distinctly enough the basis which had been proposed. This was merely play with words, but circumstances were too serious to admit of any remonstrance. The Duc de Vicenza, who succeeded the Duc de Bassano, reiterated the concurrence and the terms required by Metternich. New difficulties then arose. The sovereigns were not all at Frankfurt. And the negotiations could not be opened until their determination was known. The emperor severely felt the deception that was practiced upon him. But everything conspired against us. An epidemic had broken out among our troops. Fatigue, privation, and above all, depression of spirits had generated disease in our cantonments. Our hospitals were filled and our troops whose courage wasn't daunted before the enemy could not bear up against disappointment and want every day produced a diminution of those ranks which the sword had already frightfully thinned. Things were going on no better in Spain. Marshal Sewell had taken the command of the army, beaten at Vittoria, having by great efforts succeeded in reorganizing it. He resolved to make a bold attempt to mend our fortune beyond the Pyrenees. The English and Spanish army, which had advanced on the Bitsoa, was blockading Pampeluna. With a division. While at the same time the bulk of its forces was pressing the siege of Saint Sebastian, Marshal Sewell was very wisely determined to take advantage of these circumstances. And to cut off the division, he marched by the left and arrived before Pampeluna, while Wellington was yet under the walls of Saint Sebastian. The attack commenced at Marshal Sewell's well contrived plan would have been crowned with success, and not a deluge of rain, which descended in the mountains forced him to recall his columns. The English were not impeded by the same obstacles. They had no defiles or ravines to pass, and they arrived at a quick march just when we were ready to resume our operation. And now the misfortune intervened. M Marshal Sewell had ordered General Drouet, who commanded an intermediate position from whence he kept in check an English corps under 
General Picton, to march and join him, concealing his movement. Precisely the contrary ensued. The English corps, commanded by General Picton, rejoined that of Lord Wellington before Pampeluna at the moment when Marshal Sewell was attacking it, and General Drouet did not appear until all was over. The corps, which Jouet was to keep in check, penetrated Marshal Sewell's right flank and obliged him to retreat with a considerable loss. The mischief was now irreparable. The troops commanded by Jouet were thrown into disorder, and there remained no alternative but a speedy retreat in the course of which every sort of privation was suffered. The English army being once concentrated before the walls of Pampeluna, there remained no possibility of intercepting its line of operations, but even after the concentration was effected, Marshal Sewell would yet have succeeded in relieving the fortress. Had he been joined by General Jouet, as he hoped to be at least when General Pickton's corps appeared on the field of battle. This attempt, not having been successfully followed up, Pampeluna capitulated, and we lost our last stronghold in that part of Spain. This unfortunate event could not have happened more untimely. It extinguished all remaining hope of extricating ourselves from the fatal situation into which we had been plunged by an extraordinary succession of reverses and other and not less serious consequence, Marshal Sewell's failure was that it greatly contributed to change the disposition which the Allies had manifested through the medium of Monsieur de saint Agnès. The Duc de Bassano was blamed for not having accepted in their fullest extent the basis that were proposed. This was unjust. The draft of the letter which he wrote on the 16th of November to Monsieur de Metternich contained in conformity with the intention originally manifested by the Emperor, the explicit acceptance of the basis of Frankfurt. This part of the letter was suppressed as is evident on an attentive perusal of the document. This omission was purposely made. Napoleon, who had ascertained it from the degree of confidence due to the Allies when they spoke of peace, conceived that they might easily disavow what had been said in a confidential conversation to an individual who had no mission and no special character, and that it would be more advisable to induce them to give official consistency to their propositions. Accordingly, his minister proposed to send Monsieur de Saint-Aignan back to Frankfurt with authority to make and sign in the emperor's name a declaration of the acceptance of the basis in the presence of the ministers by whom they had been dictated. This declaration, if it had not been alluded, would necessarily have been recognized by a written note and the ground of the negotiation would thus have been diplomatically established, but Napoleon preferred the medium of a letter by which the basis of the negotiation would be implicitly accepted, though the nomination of a plenipotentiary to negotiate. He knew enough of the policy of Count Metternich, which on all occasions presented a varnish of good faith, to feel assured that he would reply by a demand for the formal acceptance of the basis proposed to which this answer would give an official and irrevocable character. I'm so convinced of this, said Napoleon to his minister, that I would dictate his letter this very day. He did not seek, as was then reported, to gain time since it was agreed that the negotiations should not impede the course of the military operations. The expected letter fulfilled all the hopes to which it had given rise for it engaged the high allied powers in the most formal way. Their majesties said, Mr. de Metternich, are ready to enter upon the negotiation whenever they become assured that his majesty, the emperor of the French, recognizes the general and summary basis, which I specified in my conference with Baron de saint Aignan. Yet after having received the assurance he wanted. He said in a tardy letter that the Allied powers were no longer ready to negotiate the general basis and that it was necessary to consult them. The emperor did not allow himself to be deceived by the artifices of the Allies. He had been actively carrying on his preparations if the propositions transmitted to him were sincere. The attitude which he sought to assume could have no prejudicial effect on the negotiations. Consequently, he appealed to the nation to take up arms. Though this measure was demanded by imperious necessity, it afforded our enemies a pretense for receding from the intentions they had manifested in the overtures of which Monsieur de Saint-Aignan was the bearer.
They published a printed declaration which was extensively circulated. This document, which was very artfully written, described the emperor as the eternal artificer of troubles and a tyrant who answered overtures of peace by conscription levies. It was endeavored to disconnect him from France by announcing that war was made against him and not against France. The people were cajoled with the hope of not losing any of their conquests. Their vanity was flattered by being told that a nation does not forfeit her claims on the esteem of her rivals or cease to be great for having in her turn experienced misfortunes. Chapter 20, the tone of sincerity so artfully infused into this specious document could not fail to make dupes in a country where it appeared no refuge against the impending danger was to be found. However, the emperor of Russia refused to go farther. France was humbled, he had attained his object, and he was unwilling to incur new chances which could only turn to the advantage of England. But the conspiracy of the interior was already plotting at Frankfurt. In that town, it was represented by a man who is celebrated for the misfortunes which he drew upon his country and for the inquietude which he disseminated from St. Petersburg to Paris. He had unavailingly employed his last remnant of influence and his solicitations had procured only the positive declaration that the Rhine could not be crossed. But an incident arose which changed this resolution. Switzerland corresponded with a disturber who, though loaded with the emperor's favor, sought only his ruin. To this man, Napoleon had dispatched his secretary. He conducted him to Alexander, to whom he delivered up the cipher and the information brought by the emissary. It was so detailed and precise that the autocrat no longer hesitated. This was the month of December. The legislative body had been convoked, and as the climax of misfortune, the opening of the session was postponed for several weeks. In the interim, the deputies of that assembly were fatally influenced by the lamentations which filled the capital. They set off for the departments where they lost their little remaining energy, and they returned to Paris only to fill up the measure of embarrassment and ruin, so that anxiety and mischievous reports completely annihilated public spirit. The Declaration of Frankfurt reached Paris, where it found persons credulous enough to place faith in its promises. We very readily believed in the reality of what we hope. People gradually persuaded themselves of the sincerity of the Allies, who were no longer looked upon as the enemies of France. Praise was even bestowed on their magnanimity, and they obtained credit for a degree of moderation which our own generals were reproached for not having wanted. The emperor struggled alone against this fatal blindness. He had too much knowledge of human nature to be duped by the artifices of his enemies, but the interest which he was supposed to have in opposing them prevented him from recovering that confidence which ought never to have been withdrawn from him. He sometimes complained to those about him and used to say, you see, gentlemen, what it is to believe in Punic faith. And he would quote the fable of the agreement between the wolves and the lambs. His courage and tranquility of mind remained unshaken. He labored day and night to create an army capable of defending our territory, but the conscription lists no longer presented disposable men, and the arsenals afforded but meager resources. All had been exhausted for the campaign of 1812 and the campaign of Saxony. Since then, but little had been done. Muskets, for one thing, were totally wanting for several years past. The emperor had been advised to make use of those which had been given to the National Guard. These arms were nearly all that the arsenals contained, but they were in such bad condition that it was necessary to get them repaired. This situation was cruel. The emperor had therefore good reason frequently to repeat, but why was I not told of all this? Why was the state of the arsenals kept from me? The deficiencies in the supply of houses of every description was extreme. 
for this branch of the service was not less exhausted than the others. It was hoped that money would overcome the difficulty. The emperor possessed a considerable treasure, the fruit of his economy. He transferred 38 millions to the public treasury, but this resource was far from being sufficient to meet the exigencies. The credit of the government was shaken without money. It was impossible to rely with certainty on anything. Under these circumstances, it was resolved to have recourse to the sale of the communal estates. This resource would have been sufficient, but although the measure was carried into effect by the regular administrative authority, it nevertheless formed one of the grounds of complaint of which the legislative body availed itself in order to deprive the government of the last support it possessed. The legislative body had been for a long time at Paris, but the session was not open. How great a responsibility rests on those persons who dissuaded the emperor from this act in order to serve their petty private interests already were the mischievous and designing, occupied with machinations. They tampered with the deputies who were discontented in consequence of the inactivity in which they were kept and particularly on account of the state of affairs, which they exaggerated because it was not brought under their view. They soon began to make all sorts of reflections and this amongst others that if the constitution had been stronger if the resources both of the population and finance had not been so entirely placed at the disposal of the government such misfortunes would not and could not have happened private resentments mixed themselves with these reflections the legislative body contained some old public functionaries who imagined they had cause to complain of the emperor those especially who had obtained neither favor nor distinction they believed that a favorable moment had arrived for bringing him to a strict account. They gave the rein to their passions. Instead of occupying themselves with the danger which menaced the state, they had all flattered. The emperor's government, during his prosperity, they had lavished praises on all the acts of his administration when they all had to do was to give their assent. They made him a thousand protestations of fidelity and attachment when he was the master of the world and in the only conjuncture, probably, in which he could have had need of their assistance to extricate the state from a danger which could not fail to involve themselves in destruction, they proved untractable and selected that moment for regulating the limits of a power which could not be too absolute for the circumstances of the moment and the bounds of which they would themselves have readily extended at a period when it might really have been abused this conduct of the legislative body completed our misfortune and a day will arrive when time which analyzes and displays everything in a proper light will invest history with the power of approaching those bad citizens who prostituted the authority which the confidence of their fellow countrymen had bestowed on them and betrayed their country to satisfy private passions the months of november and december of this year were fruitful in events the first that occurred was the capitulation of the corps, which was in Dresden. When the Battle of Leipzig was fought, this corps obtained the privilege of marching out with the honors of war and returning into France with arms and baggage. But after some days' march, it was disarmed in violation of the stipulations of the convention. Shortly after the insurrection of Holland took place, the emperor had been obliged to draft troops from that country to incorporate them with an army corps, which he was forming in Belgium, the country being left without any other defense than the garrison of the Helder and the Gorkum, a Russian corps advanced from the bank of the Ems to those of the wall past the latter river and presented to the numerous body of the discontented in Holland, a rallying point of which advantage was readily taken. The insurrection burst forth at Amsterdam and Rotterdam almost at the same time. It may be said to have occasioned no effusion of blood. The French authorities and especially the persons employed in collecting the revenue against whom the hatred was most decided fled. The cry of Orange Boven was heard everywhere, and the old collars of the stadtholder were hoisted. Never before did any country return under the dominion of its old chiefs with so little effort. The Russian corps, which protected this movement of the people, advanced to the frontier on the side of the Gorkum. The Prince of Orange arrived from England almost immediately, and everything was then finished in Holland. That is to say, we were completely expelled from that country. If General Devoe's corps, which was in Hamburg, had received orders to quit the banks of the Elbe, 
when the army retired on the Rhine and had proceeded into Holland, most certainly the insurrection would not have broken out and the war might perhaps have terminated differently. The Empress' situation was dreadful, and yet this was only the prelude to the misfortunes which were about to overwhelm him. Since the return of the king of Naples to his dominions, he had assembled his army and had entered into communication with English agents. As he was too weak to make his independence be respected, and as his cooperation would totally change the situation of the Austrians in Italy, it was very evident that the first condition which would be imposed upon him as necessary to obtain the good graces of the Allies would be to abandon the Emperor, and next to turn his arms against him. This he did, as will be presently seen, the Emperor, who well knew the in constant character of that prince, foresaw the conduct he would adopt. The Austrians had reinforced their army in Italy. It was now so superior to the force we had there that the struggle could no longer be doubtful. It penetrated in the first instance into Illyria, of which it may be recollected that Monsieur Fouché had been appointed governor during the armistice of Neumark. 